Hey, it's Joe Solari here, and uh, welcome to the Business of Writing. Today, I have Mal Cooper on. Hey, Joe. How's it going? It's going great. Well, um, this is your second time on the show. I think so, yeah. Yep, yep. Last time we were talking about a similar topic. We were talking about um, some of the things that you were doing around um, limited edition printing for uh, books and just ways to please your audience. Um, and today we're going to talk about the Kickstarter that uh, launched yesterday. Yep. So why don't you, yeah. So why don't you give a little a background for folks that might not know you, what you're, you know, what you write and what you're up to. Sure. So my name is Mallory Cooper. I write uh, science fiction under the pen name MD Cooper. I also wrote a book called Help My Facebook Ads Suck. And that's, on, you can find that on Amazon under Mal Cooper. Um, but most of my work is spent writing science fiction. I create a universe called Aeon 14. It's this massive future science fiction universe that currently has 90 books out in it. And um, one of those books, or one of the, two of the series are about a character named Rika. And that's what this whole Kickstarter is about, is actually doing more audio for Rika. Yeah, so um, let's kind of talk, work through that. And um, before we get deeper into the Kickstarter, how much of your uh, revenues now, if you don't want to share exact numbers, but just kind of percentage wise, is coming out of audio versus ebook and print? I think audio, I mean, audio varies a bunch because you don't have releases as steadily as you have for print or for ebooks. So on a good month, I might get like $3,500 out of audio, um, whereas like my monthly ebook is between twenty and 30000 Um so it's, on a good month, it's like maybe 10%. A lot of months, it's all the way down to 1,000. And, and I know it's not like, those aren't great numbers for audio, to be honest. I mean, they're, I mean, they're not terrible numbers, but they're not mm. amazing numbers either. Um, and part of one of the mistakes I had made in audio early on, well, it wasn't a mistake. It was the right thing to do at the time, was I, I took my main flagship series, and I have that with Tantor, um, which means I make like 80 cents to a dollar per sale. Um, with folks with them and I'm not really connected with them when it comes to promotion or anything like that either and um, And well, it's nice that I can get a good narrator and not to pay any money up front I really I don't have a lot of control. I can't I can't take advantage of their promotions A lot of times they do sales. And I find out about what someone tells me that my books are on sale I don't books are on sale. <laughs> um, and, and it sort of limits my options as far as packaging things together and doing creative things like that But Rika is my second most popular series and I actually already had the first three books in Rika narrated in that series, the seven book series, um, but the narrator wasn't able to continue on. And th that's where when I started thinking about how much money it would cost me to just re-narrate the entire series to have one narrator for the whole thing. And, um, and I realized at that point that, that um, I could actually get the whole thing narrated for $10,000. And at, 10, that for, at, at $30 per person, I only need 330 backers to pay for that whole, that whole narration up front. Because sort of the big thing is that narration for audiobooks costs a lot of money to get done. Mm. Um, and a lot of times you don't see a return on investment for, you know, for eight months, 12 months, depending on, on how well it goes. Sure, sure. So um, for me to get my head around it, you've got, you said 90 books out. Mm -hmm. um, how many of those are in audio? 25, 30? Okay. 30, yeah. So that's the other part of it too, is that yeah. there's, there's a, um, not everything you've written has gotten into both formats. So yeah, yeah, and that's part of it. some part of it's just that there's certain ones I'm you know I, I run I run the books and like you know I don't think this is going to be profitable in audio. Other ones where the narrators are just just take a while to get it all done, so they're behind. So mm. it's my way of like getting things caught up quickly for this series. Mm. No, that's great. So you, you mentioned that you figured the kind of the economics out on this of like if mm -hmm. you got 330 people to do this, you would come up with the money. Yeah. Um, I know from you and I talking, you were a little hesitant about Kickstarter. What got you over the hump? And um, well, part of it was seeing how well you did that you got your, you ran a Kickstarter, you got, you got your narration back, and then Michael Scott Earl has run some Kickstarters that work really well for him. Um, and I saw that and just realized that you know, worst case scenario, it doesn't work. You know, <laughs> it's not the end of the world. But um, by actually, the way it's going already, I, it'll, it's definitely going to get funded. There's no. Mm -hmm. no yeah, it, um, I, you know, when I did it, and I don't have nearly the audience that you have um, or the number of books, you know, it was really just to figure out if 
there was that potential there. And I think it's, it's, it boils down to what you're, you know, if you're realistic about what you're trying to do, like, um, I pushed it a bit with a $5,000 raise given the size of, you know, my audience, mm-hmm. I think a $10,000 raise with the size of your audience is, is, is a reasonable expectation. Mm-hmm. And when you look at, like you said, Michael Scott Earl, or you look at Michael Sullivan, the kind of money that they're doing, I mean, they're doing six figures in one Kickstarter. Yeah, um, pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So the audience is there. Yeah. Um, this one being that this, this is a series that's actually over a year old now. Like the last book in the series came out a year ago. So the fact that, so that's part of the reason why I went for a little bit lower number, because a lot of my fans have already read this series and forgotten about it. Uh, yeah. Respects. So that's part of the reason why I'm going a little bit lower. I think if it was something brand new, I probably could get, get a little bit higher faster. But uh, I'm so confident I'm going to hit my number. It's pretty much what, and I think there's, um, on Kickstarter, this is kind of an early thing, the whole funding audio projects. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, it, it certainly works, and it, there's a lot of men there that have, have gone this way. Um, but... You know, it, there is, it isn't like um, in the gaming world where there's this rabid audience that is after projects on Kickstarter. So I think yeah. that's the other thing that will change over time is you know, you're an early adopter of this as a way of raising money. I was, um, I was at a game developer conference on, well, the PAX over this last weekend. On the Thursday, I was at the, at the game dev um, portion of the conference, and they actually had um, the director of games from Kickstarter was there speaking. And she said that, that games in general do better than average on Kickstarter, and especially um, any sort of paper physical game. It, those things have like a 60% success rate. And on average, Kickstarter only has about a 30% success rate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they, do, they do really well. There are people just yeah. that signed up for those things. So. Well, there's a whole ecosystem that's developed in uh, that. I was out in um, Portland at Guardian Games, which is a really big game store, and I was talking to the guy there. and. Um, basically what happens with the game developers is they develop it, they roll it out on Kickstarter. A lot of these guys that have done a lot of them, they have a special uh, pledge level for game stores to Mm. kind of get ready to buy in early. Right. Um, And then because he was, you know, they'll say a lot of times when you're looking at a game, my kids were looking at this one game. He's like, yeah, this was on Kickstarter in 2008. And and so, um, I think that that's interesting how that space is developed where, um, you know, th- th- there's folks that are developing games now and they're, they're doing everything on Kickstarter. Then they go out to kind of traditional distribution of game stores. Yeah. Like Kickstarter is basically just part of the launch process for a lot of these yeah. games. And yeah. it's like, if they don't need, I think the way to think for physical games, I kind of feel like Kickstarter is basically a pre-order system now. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it is. It's become that's, that's kind of how I'm using it for this audio project too. Like it's, I'm going to get this book narrated because I, mm-hmm. I want to get the series narrated no matter what, you know, so it's going to happen. And it's, and the narrator that I selected is actually really quick. So it's probably gonna be done by August. So it's really just a mm-hmm. pre-order to get this, to get, you know, 60 hours of audio for $30. Well, if you look at what uh, Michael Sullivan's done with uh, his projects, that's exactly what he's doing too, is you're, he, he even goes into traditional publishing distribution. Like they've oh, wow. got a, he, so what happens is, is he raises the money to do a traditional publishing run of, you know, say 10,000 books. Wow. Uh, the folks that are buying on Kickstarter get their books six months earlier. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you get, a, of course you get a signed copy, you get all kinds of great stuff, but basically that money is used to fund that run. Then they go and put it into the traditional uh, distribution channels, which comes out just like if he was going through a traditional publisher, which was his, the way he was years ago. Right. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So it, it really is, like you said, it's just a pre-order system and his, you know, his main fans know that that's where you get the book first. Mm-hmm. And it's really, what's interesting is, is by the time that it comes out on Amazon, those people have read the book. They paid to read the book. And then they, you know, hit just he gets slammed with awesome reviews. That's really cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, so I mean, th- that's taken years for for him to develop. You know, he came out of that marketplace, and um, his wife Robin is the the brains behind that operation. But gotcha. um, um, but let's talk a little more about um, your Kickstarter. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 you know, I think it's an amazing deal and that you've, you know, 60 hours of uh, audio uh, for 30 bucks is, uh, is, is a screaming deal. Um, but how, can you give a feel to people watching like the differences and where these people are coming from? Like how many are your, do you feel are your existing fans? How many are finding you just on Kickstarter, which would essentially be a new audience? Yeah. And, so um, I think that, so I've, I only have, was it 40 backers, 49 backers, something somewhere in that neighborhood at this point. Um, 47. And, 47. And Kickstarter statistics tell me that 44% of the people that have backed me came from Kickstarter. Now, some of them might have been people that maybe um, that, that signed up for a notification, but some of those might come from Kickstarter too. It's hard to say. So it's even worst case scenario in that some of that, that number is been inflated. I'm probably getting 30% of these people are, are new, um, which is great. You know, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah. And, um, and some people actually are signing up for just the card game. I have a card game that you can get in here as well as one of my rewards. And um, it's, it's something I've had for a little while. I'm doing a version of it. It's going to be specific to this, to this um, group of characters and a version of the game that they play. Because my card game is a game that the characters play in the books. And I've actually got a number of people that's gone just for that because they just, you know, they don't, they're not interested in the audio, but they're, they're fans or maybe they're just into card games. Mm -hmm. how, many, um, how many of those have you uh, had pledged? I think I've got like four or five people who just went for that. And how much, how much is that pledge level? It's 20 bucks. Okay. So even that, um, you think about that in comparison, granted you're not doing this to like be a sales channel, but it is raising revenue. You think about the revenue you're raising per pledge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what would you, if you kind of had to make a, a guess of the gross margin on that? I mean, on the on on that particular one, it's probably it's probably um, fifty percent of that's just margin. Yeah, because uh, I think that the cards cost me around seven dollars a deck, and then I also have a printed rule sheet that I got that's probably around ten. Uh, shipping of both of those things is, is in there a little bit, so I probably spend about ten or eleven dollars per deck mm -hmm. to get them. Yeah, and when we were talking before, that the, the deck was something you had. You were doing this. How were you using it prior to Kickstarter? Um, most of the time before that, it was sort of like a, if you found me at a conference, you'd get a deck. So I uh, use it for like a, a fun marketing tactic to, to get people to come to conferences and stuff like that or a reward for, for showing up. I've been meaning to actually advertise and put it up on Etsy for some time, but it just sort of it, it fallen by the wayside. I'm sitting there with like 200 of these decks sitting there in my office. Like, I, like, I need to do something with these. But the flip side, another thing I'm doing is, except for the audiobook itself, um, and then one other reward that I'm going to add in um, soon. Every single thing that comes with this Kickstarter is going to be custom just to this Kickstarter. So mm -hmm. it's all collector stuff. The only way you're so that this though the, the card deck will be the standard card deck. The rule sheet is going to be a special rule sheet, and it's going to be awesome. like a printed two side glossy rule sheet thing that only people who back this Kickstarter will get. And then one of the, some of the pledge levels get you a, cust, uh, a special edition of the Rika Outcast book, which is the first book in the series and the art on that edition of the book, and even some of the internal stuff in that book is only ever going to be given to people who do this Kickstarter. So that's sort of a big thing I want to do so people, so even people who can't pledge a lot, I'm like, if you just pledge like uh, $10, $20 now, and then once it's fully, it's fully backed, I'll be doing, like, when, you, when you fulfill a Kickstarter, you do what's called a survey, and um, you have to get the information you need from people to ship and whatnot, and you can also bundle in add-ons. Um, I'm using the pledge manager, that lets you put a bunch of add-ons in. And if someone wants to buy, like, pick and choose, like, a one-off, uh, maybe something from one of the higher tiers, they can do that. I mean, if you, if you can pledge higher, that's better because that ensures that we're going to get funded and maybe hit some of the stretch goals, which starts to make some pretty cool stuff up here. But um, that's a way of getting it, making some people just by getting in on this at any level, we'll be able to get some of the cool swag that's, like, so it's only going to be available to folks who do that. Yeah, I think the other thing that's interesting about what you kind of touched on is um, it's not just a one and done situation. Your um, Kickstarter is actually um, a platform where you get an enormous amount of information about your mm -hmm. backers and your ability to um, bring them into your community and, and figure out how to serve them more in the future. Yeah, um, it, it's it's really interesting. You know, right down to like you can see click links and I don't yeah, know. You can and you can you can message them basically forever. 
Yeah. Because, because, you know, a lot of these things that people are buying, they might have like a one or two year production run. So you have to you mess with those updates and stuff like that. So if you want to do another Kickstarter later on, which I think I probably will, I have some plans for some other things that'd be fun to Kickstarter. Then yeah, I'll message people and I'll be like, hey, you know, you backed me on this one Kickstarter and I, I delivered all the stuff that you want. Now I've got this other Kickstarter going on. And I'll be able to reach out to them through multiple channels to, to try and get them into mm. Well, and we were talking earlier about um, gaming uh, channels and, I think that's one thing that happens is over time in these companies that do several Kickstarters, they build up an audience that understands, yeah, this guy knows how to deliver or that company has made this game. And um, I, I like that they took care of me a certain way. So I'll be more prepared to back them. Mm -hmm. And you build, you, you build that audience just like you build your audience with your books. I think probably too, when people see that like you've run successful projects, because you get a counter on Kickstarter that shows that you've, you've run successful projects. Yeah. So that's yeah. going to give them a belief that you, you can actually pull, pull through. Um, the other thing that I, so I was like, when I was at that session where the, um, it was the director of games who was presenting, she said that like people run like additional Kickstarters, their numbers always grow and they've actually reported and looked at them and whatnot and found that the majority of people that back some sequent projects back to the first one. So you get you get people that just that love to do things like that on Kickstarter, and will always just sort of that's how they they actually like to buy and fund things. Mm, yeah. Well, um, one of my clients who writes romantic comedy, her husband is um, in really into games, and we were talking about this for some of her stuff. Her stuff, but he it was one of these kind of like he started sharing how much money he spends <laughs> on Kickstarter. And I mean, it's, there's, there's an enormous eco uh, economy there of people yeah. that are buying um, in certain things, right? What yeah. certainly technology, there's this really cutting edge early adopter um, community gaming you talked about and it's, it's old school stuff, right? Yeah, it's it really, paper, is. yeah. Um, and then I would, you know, I would say that, that what's happening, what I'm seeing is more and more people understanding that this is a great place to come from um, if you're trying to get your, your audio books done. Right? Mm -hmm. there, there is people there that are interested in audio books and they're prepared to pay to um, help you get those made. Yeah. Um, I was going to say with when it comes to the audio too, is that if you're going to run your audio book through um, uh, audible, you know, they're going to sell it for 20 to $35 depending on how long it is. And you're going to see, you know, probably like four or five dollars per sale is all you're going to get out of that. They tell you, you get 40%, but because so many people are, are paying the monthly fees and using credits and stuff like that, and, and Audible allows returns, um, people can listen to the whole audiobook and then just return it on Audible. So you only see about maybe four to six dollars when Audible's charging 35. Um, so it takes a long time to make your money back on audio, but doing this, you get the money in advance. So it's already paid for. And then eventually I'll, I'll put an Audible as well down the road um, and then still get some some uh, action there too, but it's great to not have to wait a year to make your money back. Well, that's the big thing, right? Is, is that when you look at um, some, some of the folks that I know that are doing a lot of audio and are seeing their uh, for, per finished hour, you know, going up and up is that audio gets more popular. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers get big, right? Yeah. And if you're a prolific author, like if you're talking about, even if it, if you can get a book done for 2000 bucks and you multiply that times 90 book, 90 books, if you were going to do them all, I mean, it's, it's a big slug of cash and they're not all going to be successful. Yep. And even the successful ones are going to take half a year yeah. sometimes to make their money back, you know, at least for me. I mean, there are some people who do better at it, but for whatever reason, my audio isn't, isn't like, does, doesn't do as well as some of the big stuff. Mm -hmm. So well, can, change that, you know, but yeah. Um, I, I think that the other part to understand similar to like Kickstarter with audio is you're opening yourself up to a different audience, mm -hmm. right? The people that are listening to uh, audio books are um, not going to be readers or they're a, a good portion of them. Right. Um, so it's not like it's cannibalizing your existing sales. Yeah. Um, and if it's just got a high barrier to entry as far as the cost. Yeah. Um, as far as preparing for this, um, mm -hmm. how a couple things, how long did, you, did it take you to get prepared to do this? And then um, how much money did you have to invest to prepare? Because it's not free to be on Kickstarter. 
Well, I think I first started talking to you back in September. We spoke about this. That's kind of where I first got the idea to go ahead and do this. So I, I kind of had a bug in my ear in September. And then as Jill and I were planning out 2019, uh, which was in November, we talked about actually doing this. Initially, we were going to do it in February, but it just took more time to really think through the tiers, look at all the costs of everything, figure out how we're going to ship and shipping costs and whatnot. And what we ended up doing is deciding to make it so shipping is not in the, in the tiers. Because um, the way Kickstarter works normally is when you have all these different pledge levels, um, they include the shipping cost. And Kickstarter actually counts that shipping cost toward your total, which can be a little bit deceptive. So if you're like, oh, mm. I need $10,000 to do this, and you realize that Kickstarter is, you know, that, that some, of these, some people are, are in other countries and they're shipping to cost $20 per person. It kind of skews your numbers a bit. So it yeah. was, I realized I really couldn't even like figure out my, what my number should be because I didn't know what the country distribution would be. Um, so that was something I just had to figure that out. There was a lot of like little, little I's to dot and T's to cross and people to talk to. I talked to yourself and some other folks who ran Kickstarters. And then I, and then, like I said, worked to work a bunch of costs. And then I do have... Luckily, I've produced a lot of things already. I've produced the card deck. I've done a lot of print. I've done a lot of work uh, times. I've done posters for my fans and mail. I've done calendars and stuff like that. So I have a pretty good idea of how shipping is going to work um, and how much of a pain in the butt it is to do that. I have accounts set up. Like I have scales and I have tons of boxes and stuff like that and tubes for posters. So I'm I'm somewhat well set up. Also, you know, I might have to buy more depending on how the Kickstarter goes. But I sort of an understanding of what that whole process looks like. I mean, if you're completely green, and I think actually that's probably the biggest thing is if you're shipping any physical products, fulfillment is complicated um, and really time consuming. So I think probably that's something that people might underestimate that one shouldn't underestimate because it could, it could be expensive and time consuming to fulfill all the stuff and to wait for all the pieces to come in and try and box. It doesn't look like you just like shove a bunch of things in there and, and sent it off as well, you know, because you're going to want them to have a good experience. You're going to want them to open that box and have it look nice. And like you had some care and attention when you packaged everything. So there's a lot of little eyes about to cross across. Yeah, I would say in, like in mine, um, it ended up being where, you know, all the money I made went either to the actual, you know, project of getting the audio made um, or the stuff produced, right? It wasn't like there was, oh, wow, I did this massive Kickstarter and there's all this money laying around afterwards, right? It, yeah. it all went, but I was in a little different boat in that um, I was scrambling after the fact, right? Like right, was, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, can I find, you know, how can I get this book made? How can I get that done? Um, and there was, just, you just, I had known like the limited edition book. I knew how much it was going to cost, mm -hmm. but you, um, but then you, you, you forget the little things in between, like, okay, I got it. Like you say, I, I don't want to just throw this in a cardboard box. that has been in the basement. I want to like, make sure the packaging yeah. is nice. So, oh, how much do cardboard exactly. boxes cost? You probably want to like, write, you know, think you gotta, like write a letter and print out a note that goes in each one and sign that you want to really want to, cause the whole point behind doing this is to give people a personal touch. Cause that's, you know, cause they, they can buy all, they can buy things all day long on Amazon, spend all their money there, but you want to make sure this is a personal thing that, that they're getting the special because they did this. Mm. Well, and in my case, everyone that um, came in at the highest level were not fans that I had beforehand. These were all people that came through Kickstarter that were into collecting those types of books. So, yeah. you know, I wanted to make sure that when the next time I do that, that they're around, um, because that ended up being about 30% of the money I raised and it had uh, the best margins, right? So, you, you know. I actually, I'm not 100% sure, but I had someone that backed me at my $500 level and I don't know who they are, which I thought was, I mean, it might be that they just used a different name than normal, but like that was pretty surprising to see someone back at that level and not know who they were. Um, I know in my case, they were all strangers. Which is um, wild, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, that the great thing is, is you've got that contact now, so you can, you can check that out later against, you know, some of your other stuff. And, and I did find some of those too, right. That were, um, um, they use different email addresses based on yeah. what they signed up for my newsletter versus what they actually use, you know, because that's the other thing is a lot of them are using their, their PayPal. Yeah. Um, email address them. Yeah. Then maybe the one that they, that they yeah. It's so it's still neat though, like but even just to get that information, you know, 
And the, this, this combined with some other things that I've done is probably going to give me close to like a thousand email or physical mailing addresses for my fans, which is actually a pretty neat thing to have too. Well, that's the thing that I, you know, I love to hear you talk about and I think is so important is this isn't just about you raising the money. It's about you b- building a bigger audience and, and yeah. places where other authors aren't swarming trying to get fans. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have a plan. So I, I did Christmas cards uh, two years ago, and I've done a couple other things that give me physical addresses for my readers, and I also will have this. So my Christmas cards plus um, Patreon plus this plus um, my Etsy store probably gives me, at this point, when this will be done, I'll have over a 1,000 physical mailing addresses. And I actually plan to do like a Christmas in July thing because no one's really does, doing a lot of big marketing, physical marketing to readers in July. Um, so I'm going like, to send Christmas cards to everybody in July. Um, this year, or some, maybe we'll be Christmas card, do some sort of like, hey, you know, thanks for being here on 14th fan. You know, mm-hmm. And that's something that you can, like, you can only do. And then, you know, it's going to give them some warm fuzzies. So the next time they think about who they're going to, what book they're going to buy, they might be a little more inclined to buy mine. Yeah. Well, and and um, getting people comfortable with the idea uh, of Kickstarter is mm-hmm. hard too. Like, you probably have a lot of fans that are prepared to um, work you know, to support that, but they're just not comfortable with it. So that's yeah. maybe something else to think about is how you can help them get through that. You know, it's fairly complex behavior, right? You got to go find the thing, then you got to go set up your account and pledge, but you know, pick your tier and examine all the rewards, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I, you, you, you kind of mentioned it and alluded to it, but um, where, what are you seeing as kind of your average, pledge level and the money you're making per backer? So I think the, the average pledge is $75 right now, which is pretty good considering that the, the main thing is get the audio book for 30 bucks. So a lot of people are going over. It's, I mean, it's, it's skewed a little bit high by some of those folks that are like, the guy that pledged 500. Um, and, but there's a couple of people that pledge the 250 level and some 100s as well. So, and there's people that just pledge at weird levels too. Like a bunch of people have pledged at $49 when I have no forty-nine dollar level. I can only assume that they they pledged they they, they picked the day one forty-three dollar tier, and then just added some more money or something like that. So it's kind of weird what people do. Yeah, that it, that's something that you just it's it, you, it takes some time to, and I don't fully understand. Get used to is like like why is why is it that you gave me forty nine dollars when there isn't a four? I, I had the same thing happen too. It's like the numbers were weird, and then I go and look, and you see oh. The guy pick this level and pledge more money, which you can do on Kickstarter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's the other thing I think is um, interesting for authors is when you think about, and you, I know you know these numbers, what, you know, for somebody that reads through your series, what's their lifetime value? Oh, it's, I haven't calculated it in a little while, but it's around $250. Right. So but now, now you figure if some of those people you know, there's a segment that are going to be those people, but then they also back you on Kickstarter and they just added on average, say $40. Yeah. That, that sort of assumes, and that's like, that's basically what that means. That number to me is, um, anyone who picks up a book one in any of my series, and I have 23 different series. So anyone that buys a book one on average makes me $250, Mm -hmm. um, which means that some of those people, don't do anything beyond buy a 99 cent book and other people spend a thousand or more dollars with me. Cause I have some fans who will buy, who will read every book I have in KU and then they buy them all because they understand how the economics work on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they're even savvy to the point where they, some of them worked out that um, if they read the book in KU and then buy it in the same month, that the author doesn't get the money. So they wait a month and then they buy the book. Like they're actually pretty regimented about this. And then they'll buy signed copies. They'll buy print editions. You know, they'll they'll buy. I have a I have a soundtrack, um, and I have another one that just got finished. So they'll buy that stuff. They buy the calendar because um, they just. And I have some fans who who support me on Patreon at a level of fifty dollars a month and decline the rewards that they get from that. Wow. So it's it's there. There are people out there who really want to support arts and artists, and they'll they'll do everything they can, you know, to to do that. And I think. I think a lot of people just like collecting memorabilia. Like these, some folks are just going to spend their money on stuff, and they figure I'm going to spend money on something I can get directly from a creator because that's not something you can get that much these days. 
Yeah, I, um, I read a thing um, the other day that they're selling $12 million a month in custom lightsabers at Galaxy's Edge Parks, right? So the, the, the marketplace for memorabilia is huge. Yep. And it isn't just confined to those huge brands. It's like if you're, if you're prepared to do like you've done over these years and develop intellectual property that has tangible things attached to it people if they have that emotional connection they'll buy it they want it yeah exactly yeah um so you talked you talked about kind of the time and preparation of being several months cost wise i I know you said you had a lot of this stuff already kind of made but was there any additional cost that you incurred or are you running ads what are you trying to do that um, I'm going to start, I'm actually, I'm going to kick off some ads today, but up until then, I, I didn't run any ads ahead of time. I sort of primed my, uh, my, my, once you go to sort of have your Kickstarter ready, you can put up like a, a notification page. So I put that mm-hmm. up like a week or two ago and I contacted a lot, I, I hit up my fan base and said like, Hey, please sign up, go to Kickstarter and say that you want to be notified um, about when this Kickstarter goes live. And those people get notified, I believe when it goes live and then they get notified again a couple of days before it ends. So it's a way to make sure that you can kind of get people in the in the pipeline. They'll also get all your. They'll get notified every time you send out an update. Right. Yeah. And I plan on doing updates fairly often. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll do a bunch. I'll focus them more in the beginning and the end. But I'm going to keep some going because um, I, I have some things I'm actually saving up that I can like announce midway. Because I've been told from from a lot of people that the middle of a Kickstarter is the dry period. You do really well the first two days. And you do really well the last two days. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the lady, and this was for games. She said in games, the last two days mirror the first two days. Mm. That's how it works. She said a lot of people panic in the middle, and then usually it's all fine at the end. Um, yeah, it, it's what I've seen. It's relative. Even if you have a really good Kickstarter, so let's say it funds in the first twenty four hours, you're still going to have this big lull in the middle, and then it just comes back to life. Right? It's yeah. it's weird. But. I would have loved to find it in the first 24 hours, but I mean, it's also, it was a Sunday. It was sort of a slow day, you know, in, in the world. And I do kind of wonder if maybe the, 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 the coronavirus scares people from spending money that they might have spent otherwise. I'm not sure if that's, that's a big impact yet, but it could be for some people. Never know. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's affecting the stock market, so it might be affecting other purchase decisions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we talked about, um, how, you know, audio has been, you know, something you've been focused on. Is there any other things that now that you've, um, you know, you've explored a lot of stuff. You, like you said, you calendars, card games. What are some of the other things that you're thinking about for making it fun for your fans to experience the AN14 brand? So, so the thing, what, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, coronavirus be damned, I'm going to... <laughs> Um, unless like the world explodes, I'm going to London this uh, Saturday, and while I'm there, one of the people I'm meeting with is a company that's going to be making a tabletop RPG game for Aeon 14. Um, I don't actually need to kickstart it because they're paying for it all themselves. Now maybe we'll do a Kickstarter before it comes out as a way to like maybe make a collector's edition or something like that that we can that we can fund through Kickstarter. But that thing will happen regardless. Um, but that's another another avenue where I'm trying to bring in more fans from, mm-hmm. from other things because the plan for this game is even though it's gonna be an Aeon 14 game, we're gonna do our best to brand it in a way that like, this is just an awesome sci-fi game that you can play and that you don't need to you know, be an existing Aeon 14 fan to play it. And it's gonna come with a companion book as well. So it can be a book written just for, like a novel written for the RPG. Oh yeah. Novel's actually gonna be sort of the canonical version of the adventure you get to go on um, in the game. So it's going to be recommended not to read the novel before you play the thing <laughs> it comes in the game, but sort of a, a fun way to see, the, see how things went. Um, and then you can sort of say, like, wow, I did a better job than the canonical characters, or, or I should have done that thing that they did. That worked out really well for them. So I think it's going to be sort of a fun thing that you don't normally get to do. You don't get to sort of have this canonical um, you know, novel that goes along with, along with your adventure. I think something that might be fun to do with that even, too, is like if people have, like, People can actually write really cool campaigns, you know, and maybe we turn those into novels at some point. There's you know, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of options for that. Um, kind of like what what um, what Dragonlance was. Dragonlance was really originally just a D and D campaign, mm. um, and that they they decided to turn to books. Well, um, you know, 
here in our house, we're big, you know, uh, Warhammer players. My kids play 40,000 and Age of Sigmar, and I've been playing since I was their age. And they've always had, the, you know, the books along with that, right? And um, it's, it's funny, my kids, how much they know about the canon of that world. It's way more than I just, I love playing the game, but like they're right. spend so much time under, like they'll just talk for hours about this stuff. Um, and it's because they read those books and they're, they're into the whole thing. And it's kind of a way to one up your, your brother. Yeah. Like, um, and I think that that's the part that um, sometimes uh, creators forget is that that's, that experience, that other stuff is, is just as important as the actual story, right? Like there's the experience of reading the story, but when you build kind of this story world that you've done over, over the, the past few years, that people want to know all that stuff and they want to really be, you know, geeking out on the fandom. Yeah. Um, and that's, um, you know, something that, not only you can enjoy helping them do, but you can actually make some money on. Yeah. And I think like when I was a kid, it was the sort of thing I loved too. Like I loved like totally, like I geeked out on Tolkien. I like collected all the maps, you know, and all the art books and stuff like that. So it's something that's just fun to do because you want to build out this full world. It's, it's a way of doing that. And then, yeah, if I can, if I can keep the, the whole thing funded and rolling, you know, then I get to yeah. do more stuff. Well, I wouldn't be – going back to your game that you're going to be do, talking through, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the, um, when you have that conversation, your partners say part of their strategy is to launch it on Kickstarter, even though they have, you know, the funding. It's not just about the funding. It's like we've talked earlier. It's like, well, we want to go where there's a bunch of people that like to play tabletop games. Where are they? They're on oh, Kickstarter. They're on, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, basically, it's just part of the advertising animal still. We have been talking about like doing figurines and stuff like that, so that might be something we would kickstart for. That we can get like ten thousand dollars, that will pay for all the develop, all the the casting and the modeling of all the figurines, mm -hmm. and, and then people who back up and get some of those. Well, I know. I think uh, Chris um, Fox is doing something with that, where mm -hmm. um, it's his stretch goals on his Kickstarter. And I'll be talking to him on Wednesday where you, you, what you get is the, you get the, the 3D um, model, um, the file for it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right? And then you go and you print it out yourself, right? Oh, so like, that's cool. So like in the case of like my kids, they could take that to their high school and mm -hmm. they've got a 3D printing lab there. They would just load it in the computer and print it print out, it out yeah. right so there's there's some other stuff now that i mean it's not going to be as nice if you're as say like you're talking about where you go resin cast or yeah you, you know you do it, it, it those models always look a little jinky but <laughs> um but still it's a way to do it um cost effective for everybody yeah exactly yeah and and i've got prices i've got quotes on all that now too it would cost about three thousand dollars to get something modeled and cast and then ready for production and whatnot. And one of the things we're thinking about too, is we could make something that's like, I, I even like maybe eight inches tall, you know, it's like almost as tall. Oh as yeah. Yeah. Um, those might require the, the, the customer to actually, or the, the, the whoever, whoever's getting it um, to glue some things together. But I almost kind of feel like that might be a bonus. Like here's your model. Now you've got to put it together, you know? Well, I, you know, I've got, a lot of plastic in my basement <laughs> that I've you got spent, you, stuff. Yeah. 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 You know, and unfortunately I've passed that addiction on to my children. So, um, it, it's expensive. If, if Susie what knew is, how much, I was gonna say, what does she think about the, all the plastic? In your basement? Well, you know, we're getting ready to move. So she's like, no more, you're not buying anything anymore and you're not putting anything together until we get the move done because, all right, now, as as like a, a fashionista like your wife, I have to ask if she's doing the same thing because I have trouble I have trouble believing that she's quelling the purchasing. Uh, well, what she's doing is she's doing a lot of trips to the resale shops, moving stuff out. Oh, okay. Oh, she is being responsible. Yeah, okay. she is. She is. So there's kind of a major purge going on. It doesn't mean that once we relocate, there won't be a re 
filling of the <laughs> coffers. <laughs> this is just an opportunity to get new stuff. She's, you know, that's the thing about her. Um, I don't, I, granted, I know there's a few things that I've seen more than once, but I mean, you know how she is. I don't, it doesn't seem like she's ever worn the same thing twice. But it's not like, I mean, we've got a lot of closet space here, but it's not like you would think it would be, right? It's not like a cribs closet where it's a garage. But um, <laughs> certainly when we were looking at uh, new places, that's one thing that always figures in is like how much closet. <laughs> <laughs> this is not surprising at all. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, it's been great having you on. Um, I wish you the best with this. And, uh, you know, you're you're a third of the way in with less than 24 hours. It looks like it's going to do really well. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, let's just keep in touch on this and then we'll, um, I, I love to hear how it ends up and where we, we, we finally finish with this. Yeah, we could do like maybe a, a post-mortem, maybe not yeah. a word, uh, retrospective. Yeah. Um, One last thing before we, like, I, um, what is your, have you announced any stretch goals or are those top secret or there's, there's two stretch goals right now. One of them is if we make it to $15,000, then shoot, I can't remember the specifics now. There's a, there's a star chart that I want to make like a really okay. nice star chart and people, people at a certain tier level will get that. And we'll also um, narrate the first book in Rika's second series as well. So we'll add yeah. another, another audio book. And then the second stretch goal is $20,000. If we hit that, then two more audiobooks get narrated. So it would end up being 10 audiobooks in total. And also, um, that's when we start with uh, people at a certain tier. Um, and above, we'll, get a, we'll actually get the resin figurine that, um, that we've been planning on. Cool. And then that resin figurine, too, will be available for anybody to purchase who wasn't at that tier. So and after it's all done and we're, we're all funded and everything's paid for, then I'm gonna, you do what's uh, through, through your... Um, your pledge manager will do it. The survey will have add-ons. And one of them people can add that in. But it'll probably be more expensive to get that stuff after the fact. You know, like I'll, yeah. be, I'll, I'll be plugging those things at sort of a retail price versus, you know, the you got this sure. price. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the whole benefit of, of pledging early and doing this stuff, right? So, yeah, exactly. Well, Mallory, it was great to have you on the show again. And um, we'll uh, we'll check back in and hear how far we went past our stretch goals. I hope so. It'd be awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>